Hello there. I'm Marianne Talbot. I'm Director of Studies in Philosophy at Oxford University's Department for Continuing Education. We're about to start a six-week course called Critical Reasoning for Beginners, and we're going to go through looking at how to recognise an argument, what arguments are, the different types of arguments, that's deduction and induction, and we'll be looking at how to set out arguments logic book style, how to analyse them, then we'll be looking at how to evaluate them. And finally, we'll look at fallacies, which are arguments that look like good arguments, but which are bad arguments. OK, so we're going to start off on the first week with how to recognise arguments and what the nature of an argument is. Right, OK, let's get started. Uh, you're all here to do um, critical reasoning. OK, why, why, why do you want to do critical reasoning? A couple of you tell me. What, what you want to do it for? What, what do you think you can't do now that you want to be able to do by the end of this course? I'd like to sharpen my sense of argumentation. Sharpen your sense of argumentation. Is there anyone you want to argue with in particular? Half of the wife. Half of the wife, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it won't work, you know. You've been married too long. I certainly haven't. No, just, just generally speaking, but particularly um, political arguments and debate. Right, okay. So another hand over here, someone. Detect the flaws in other people's arguments. You want to be able to detect the flaws in other people's arguments. Okay, what about your own arguments? <laughs> yeah. That too. Because it, it, that's very important. So one of the things I'll talk about today is something called the principle of charity. Uh, and you'll see where, where I'll talk about that. Don't want to I also um, don't want to get lost mm -hmm. as a valid point maker. So to actually be able to have conviction of what I'm saying, if I believe in it not let someone more intellectual and eloquent beat me down. Right, okay, so, and one, one thing that will help, I mean it won't do the trick completely because of course it, that com confidence has to come from you, um, but it will help to feel that you know where you are in arguments, certainly. Let me try yeah. to psychology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one at the back there. Uh, I read the overview of Thomas More and a lot of that That's how I came to philosophy, funnily enough, to, it was something like that. I did an open university course. I was a mature student, not very mature, 26. Um, and as I, uh, it was an open university course. They did logic in those days, formal, symbolic logic. And I, I tried to do this logic, and I found it so difficult, really, really difficult. And I sat up all night uh, and still trying to do it. And in the morning, I realised that I'd had such a much nicer night, much better night than I'd had with all sorts of other things you might stay up all night to do. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And that's what got me into philosophy in the first place. I, I came, I think been thrown out of school at 15. I came on here um, eventually. Eventually, that took quite a long time. Um, but I, I have never lost my love of philosophy. I've never lost my love of learning. Uh, and that's all down to philosophy, this confidence you have in argument. Because... If you can learn how to argue properly, you can. Nothing is hidden from you in principle. It's always possible to, to tease out the arguments and to evaluate the arguments and to take yourself that step further. And so I hope that after this series of six lectures, of course you're not going to go away <coughs> knowing all about logic and knowing all about how to reason properly, but I hope what I'll have done by that time is given you more confidence and given you a feeling for the fun it can be so that you'll go away and, and start looking yourself and, and I'll be very happy to pass on some reading or give some other ideas of how you might do that. Right, okay, let me tell you about Monty Python. I'm sure some of you know about it, but what it is, it's, it's called the Argument Clinic. And one man, I've forgotten his name, goes in and there's John Cleese sitting there and he says, is this the place for uh, arguments or something like that? And John Cleese says, um, what if it is? Or, um, well, I'm here for an argument. Well, no, you haven't. Yes, I have. No, you haven't. Yes, I have. And this goes on. He says, you're not arguing, you're contradicting me. And John Cleese says, no, I'm not. He says, yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. And so it goes on. Then he presses a bell. That's the end of the session. He says, but that wasn't five minutes. Yes, it was, says John Cleese. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was. I'm not arguing, says John Cleese. And so on. And um, that was supposed to be an amusing introduction. But what I wanted to move on to is the idea that uh, John Cleese had it wrong. Of course, argument isn't a set of contradictions. It isn't a set of just... You say one thing and I say another. That doesn't get us anywhere. 
Part of the point of argument is to move us on from where we are to somewhere a bit further. Just imagine if the only way we could find out about the world was through our senses. If, the, if we could see one thing and, and form one belief, but not take that belief and move on to, a, to another belief. So you could say that that's blue and the carpet's blue, but you couldn't say when two things are the same colour they match, therefore the, the chair and the carpet match. Do you see what an argument takes us from where we are to, to where we want to be, or sometimes where we don't want to be? We'll never get very far without argument. Uh, yes, if I can. There we are. Thank you. Not so much. How's that? <laughs> We're awash with technicians here, and we can Okay, so let's have a look at the definition of an argument. Uh, an argument is a set of sentences, and I put sentences there after you wouldn't believe it, spending half an hour wondering whether I should put statements, propositions, or expressions of statements or something. But I'm putting sentences, and anyone who wants to quarrel with that is most welcome to do so. A set of sentences such that one of them is being said to be true, and the others are being offered as reasons for believing the truth of the first. Okay? That's all there is to an argument. I put others with the S in bracket here because, of course, it, we might say that one thing is true on the basis of just one other um, sentence. So here's an argument. It's Friday. Marianne always wears jeans on a Friday, so Marianne will be wearing jeans today. Okay, that's a set of sentences that is, as a matter of fact, an argument. Okay, what, what are the sentences? Tell me what the sentences are. This is an easy question to Friday. lull you into a false sense of security. It's Friday. Friday. Uh, it's Friday. That's one sentence. Okay. It's um, I've got a comma after it because I've gone straight on to the other sentence. Um, but that doesn't matter. It is Friday as a sentence. Okay. Next one. Marianne Told you it was easy. Marianne always wears jeans on a Friday. That's right. So. Next one, Marianne will be wearing jeans today. Okay, those are the sentences that make up the argument. Exactly so. Um, now, here's a bit of te technology, terminology for you. God, I'm technology focused, aren't I? Conclusion is the sentence being said to be true, and the premises are the sentences being offered as reasons for believing the other one. Okay, and remember that might be just one. There might be just one premise. There doesn't need to be two. There could be 20 premises. Um, but, but what makes something a premise and what makes something a conclusion is the role that they're playing in the argument, the function that they're performing. So here's the argument again. What's the conclusion of the argument? That's right, yep, yeah, that's the conclusion because that's the one we're saying is true. And what are the premises? That's right. So there, there are two premises to this argument and one conclusion. Okay, very simple stuff. So there's the conclusion in red, Marion will be wearing jeans today, and the premises in green. Um, it, it's very important to distinguish arguments from sets of sentences. Um, let's see how to do that, because an argument is a set of sentences, but it's more than that. So there's more to an argument than a set of sentences. Question at the back. I'm very happy to take questions. If I think they're going to go on too long, I'll shut you up and, and put you on to the question time. Or if I think it's complicated or something, but otherwise I'm quite happy to take you on. Um, well, the, the question then is, presumably one, one sentence as a premise depends on another, because it's Friday is irrelevant until you know that Marianne always wears jeans on a Friday. Uh, in that particular argument, yes, uh, that's a good question. Let's go back to it. Um, I... I Actually, I'm very happy for you to ask questions, because if you do, it might be a clarificatory question like that one, which is quite useful. Um, if you look at that, let's get to that one. Um, if you take out that premise, um, you might still have an argument. You say, it's Friday, so Marianne will be wearing jeans today. But what have you done? You've left the implication. 
No, she always wants to be afraid. That's right. You've left a suppressed premise, haven't you? Because that wouldn't be a good argument. It would still be an argument, actually, because you'd still be giving one sentence as a reason to believe another one. Um, but it wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't be an argument that could possibly be convincing were it not for that. So we often leave premises suppressed um, in an argument, but usually when because of the context or because of something that that we can assume, um, we assume that the person knows the other one. So if we all knew, if you knew that every time I, well, um, that every Friday I wear jeans, if you all knew that, that would be an argument without the second premise. So thank you for that. If people, if people didn't have that assumption, is that what would be termed a non sequitur? Yes. Yeah, well done. Uh, and we'll say something more about non sequiturs, not today probably, but later in the course. You could actually say, Marianne always wears jeans on Friday. She is wearing jeans today. You could leave out then. You don't need to say it's Friday. Uh, yes, you could, you could. I mean, that would be a different argument, but it would be a, an argument, yes. <laughs> well, uh, woo, that would be a false argument. Hold that one. We'll come back to that in a minute, and you'll see what I'm going to say about that. But I just want to note that. Um, okay, I'm going to move on, um, because yes, you can make an argument out of... Well, uh, let me just move on and show you exactly what I'm going to say there. Okay, um, it's important to distinguish arguments from sets of sentences. Sets of sentences that are not arguments might either have no relation at all between them, or they may have between a relation other than that characterising an argument. For example, a set of sentences might be consistent, i.e. such that they can all be true together, without being an argument. Do you see what I mean? Or they could be related by all referring to... What's your name? Mike, um, they could be related in that way without being an argument. Uh, do you see what I mean? There are lots of different ways sets of sentences can be related, uh, but the relation, in order to be one of argument, it's got to what? Uh, it, sorry, say? Good. In order to be an argument, there's got to be one sentence that's, that you're putting forward as being true, and the other sentences or sentence is a reason for believing that thing. That's the relation that characterises an argument, nothing else. Um, here's a set of sentences that isn't an argument. The sea is salt, Melbourne's in Australia. But it's very easy to make it an argument. The sea is salt, therefore Melbourne's in Australia. Now, do you think I've made that an argument or not? No, why not? It's a false argument. It's a false argument. Shh. <laughs> no, that particular one, I, I, you'll see why I'm saying this in a minute. It's a what? There's no link between them. So, so you think that my putting the therefore in doesn't make it an argument? Okay, now let me tell you a little story. Okay, we're, we're doing a panel show. Okay, we, we've got to um, find out things and, and uh, find out other things and then come back and we'll win a huge prize. Now, we're particularly ignorant contestants here. Um, we don't know whether the sea is salt and we don't know whether Melbourne's in Australia, but we do know that if one of these sentences is true, so is the other. Okay, that's all we know. We know, we know if one of these sentences is true, so is the other. So now we've got to find out whether, whether either of these sentences is true. So half, us, uh, half of us run off to see whether the sea is salt, and the other half run off to find out whether Melbourne's in Australia. And the Melbourne's in Australia, sorry, the sea is salt ones come back first. They say, the sea is salt, therefore Melbourne's in Australia. Yay! Is that an argument? No. no. What do you mean, no? That's a perfectly good argument, isn't it? It, what I'm doing there is, is I'm giving a reason. I'm saying Melbourne is in Australia is true, aren't I? Mm -hmm. And I'm giving a reason for believing it, namely the truth of the seas being salt. Fair enough? Yeah. Yeah. Is it an argument? Yeah. 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 
And what's... OK, it was an argument before I gave you the context, actually, because arguing is something that we do with sentences. OK, it's... it's we do them because of all sorts of things to do with our background, what we've just found out, our desires, our hopes, our fears, our intentions, things like that. Arguing is something we do, and we can do it in any way. This is why the idea of artificial intelligence, um, I, which was talked about a great deal a few years ago, is getting, frankly, nowhere. And the reason it's getting nowhere is human beings can see the relevance once the context is provided, that a computer so far can't see. I mean, fingers crossed that, that we will be able to deal with this one. But the fact is, I, the minute I give you the context, you can see the argument, can't you? Some of you. Um, lottery. <laughs> is this just context, or is it an, an, an implicit uh, uh, sentence? That the fact that we haven't explicitly said both must be true if one is true. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. That in fact, there, you might say there are a lot of... Um, you could say there's a suppressed premise in there, which is that if the sea is salt, then Melbourne is in Australia. There, and I've given that by giving the context, if you like. So if we were game contestants in that situation, I wouldn't have to give that suppressed premise because we would all know it. But, but again, well done. So you picked up the point at the back. The suppressed premise is the same as context. No, no. In providing the context, I uh, enabled us to see the suppressed premise, if you like. Um, because just at the moment, there's no suppressed premise that we can see. I mean, we don't see why that's an argument. You all denied it was an argument because you can't see the relevance between the two. What I did was make one relevant to the other. And in doing so, I provided you with the premise that, that was suppressed. So there's a suppressed premise, which is a sentence, because premises are always sentences, um, and that's what I provided by providing the context. Um, okay, I'm, I'm struggling with that because that's all right. That's because Melbourne is in Australia, not because the sea is salt, but because the first Ooh. sentence is true. Oh, now this is, is a very interesting. Different? Okay, very interesting question. What you're confusing. I apologise, is causation and entailment. The premises, the, premises, the premises of an argument do not cause the conclusion to be true. Okay? If that's a premise and that's a premise, do you think that what's caused me to wear jeans today is these two things? Not necessarily. I mean, it, it might be, or it might be that actually I wear jeans on a Friday because to commemorate the first pair of jeans that my mum ever bought me, or something like that. I can't think of a good reason for wearing jeans on a Friday. You might wear jeans every day. I, I might wear jeans every day, yes, exactly. Um, so so um, the fact that A and B together entail C doesn't mean that A and B cause C. Okay? And when you say that the sea is salt doesn't cause Melbourne to be in Australia, you're quite right. But saying that the sea is salt therefore Melbourne in Australia isn't implying causation of any kind. Okay? What do you do if you have two other Melbournes in the world? Ah, you ignore them. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, uh, again, that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked it. Um, let's go to the sea of salt one, please. Well, actually, you could do it with the Marianne one as well, because there are lots of people called Marianne other than me in the world. Um, all that it means is, if, if Marianne... Is there anyone else called Marianne in this room? All right, put out your hand if you're called John. <laughs> <laughs> this is the second time this has happened to me. OK, there are no Johns in this room. That's just a myth. You're Mike. Yeah. Is there anyone else called Mike? Mike. Uh, two Mikes in this room. If I, have a, if I say Mike is tall... Okay, at the moment that's ambiguous, isn't it? It has two meanings. I could be referring to that mic or that mic. Uh, and one of you may be short, in which case it would be false of one and true of the other. But what I've actually got here is two sentences. Um, oh, how complicated am I going to get here? There's a type of sentence. Um, I have no pens. 
believe it or not, that was another thing that uh, fell off the list. Would you mind? Um, I bet you can't see this. No. <laughs> yes, you can imagine it. <laughs> okay, Mike is tall, is what it says. Now, if I put, actually, let's forget Mike, let's put John is tall there. Now, if I put John is tall up there, that has no meaning, doesn't it? it in the context of this room, in the sense that there's nobody to whom John refers, as we know. Okay, but I could use that sentence, John is tall, to say something, couldn't I? Uh, in the same way, here is a sentence type that could be used to say things, and I could use this type of sentence to say, Mike is tall, or I could use the same sentence to say, Mike is tall, but those are two different tokens of the same type of sentence. See what I mean? So just as that's one token of the type chair, and that's another one, and this is one token of the type human being, and that's another one, uh, Mike is tall is one token of the, that type of sentence, and Mike is tall is another token of that type of sentence. So actually, if you have two Melbournes, you could have two arguments that that could be. Uh, it could either be the sea of salt, therefore uh, Melbourne which is in the Northern Territory is in Australia, or Melbourne, which is in, um, thank you, Victoria, uh, is in Australia. Or in Derbyshire. Or in, well, no, not in Derbyshire, because that would falsify that one, wouldn't it, unless there's a Derbyshire in Australia. <coughs> Melbourne's in it. Yeah. I'm going to hold over that question and I'm going to um, tag it together with, with your claim that the argument's false. Okay, and I'll come back to it uh, shortly. Okay, so um, arguing is something that we do with sentences. We could, any sentences could form part of an argument. There's no such thing as a sentence that couldn't be part of an argument. And what makes it an argument is the fact that we are making an argument claim. We're putting forward one sentence and we're offering the other sentences as reasons to believe that sentence. So you cannot recognise arguments by recognising the sentences that are in arguments. You've got to recognise the relation between the sentences. Okay, let's have a look at these. Which of these sentences are arguments? Right, who thinks that this is an argument? Okay, no one else. Okay, why do you think that's an argument? He's making the assumption the storm broke because the clouds formed and the sky blackened. But the the storm is. broke because the clouds formed and the sky blackened. Does that make it an argument? Because... That word because is very difficult because distinguish causes and reasons for something. Okay? There can be a causal relation between two events. So a causal relation between two events and there can be a rational relation between two sentences or two beliefs. Okay? And we tend to use because for both of these types of relation. But these are causes and these are reasons. And you were making the, and, and you shouldn't be worried about making this error because it's a very, very common one. You were thinking of the causal relation as a rational relation, but it's not, is it? Okay. So that's not an argument because all we're saying is that actually three events happened, aren't we? First the clouds formed, then the sky blackened, then the storm broke. And there may be a causal relation between them, but we're not saying that these two are a reason for believing the other, are we? You with me? What about this one? Is this an argument? Put your hand up if you think yes. Yes, okay. Which is the conclusion? And the premise is... That's right. Manchester's North Oxford, Edinburgh's North Oxford, 
Uh, sorry, Edinburgh's north of Manchester, Edinburgh's north of Oxford is the conclusion. Okay, so this one is, since Manchester is north of Oxford and Edinburgh is north of Manchester, Edinburgh is north of Oxford. Edinburgh is north of Oxford is the conclusion, the other two are the premises, that's definitely an argument. Uh, okay, witches float because witches are made of wood and wood floats. Is that an argument or not? Put your hand up if you think it is an argument. Okay, that's an argument. You're quite right. What's the conclusion? Which is float. Okay, and then the premises are? And wood floats, that's right. Notice that the conclusion is at the front here. Doesn't make any difference, does it? Because what makes the sentence a conclusion? It follows from the other two premises. Uh, no, because it might not follow from the other two premises. Right. It might be a bad argument. What makes something a conclusion? The word because. No. no. <laughs> I wanted that in sentence as well. Well, because, because, uh, because, because the premises, it Even if you had it in argument one, it wouldn't have done. Come on, somebody! It's the one you're saying is true. That's right. You're, you're saying this is true because of the others. And where the because is a rational because, not a causal because. Okay, um, let me tell you again. The only thing that makes a sentence a conclusion or a premise is the role that it's playing in the argument. Okay, if it's playing the role of being the, the um, sentence for which you're arguing, then it's a conclusion. And if it's playing the role of a sentence for which, sorry, which you're offering as a reason for believing the other one, then it's a premise. Okay, that's the only thing that makes a sentence a premise or a conclusion. Even what, it, if what it's saying is not true, actually. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll come on to truth in a minute. Too. Truth is, you're quite right to think that truth's very important, but um, not just yet. Um, notice, incidentally, that there's no, uh, there's no reason why a, a sentence that's playing the role of a conclusion in one argument can't play the rem role of a premise in another argument. Do you see what I mean? That's why it's very important that what makes them a pre premise or a conclusion is the function they're playing, the role they're playing, not anything intrinsic to the sentence. Because if it was intrinsic to the sentence, you'd have a sentence that could only be a conclusion, um, which would be rather odd, wouldn't it? I mean, I'm sure there are. So I might be able to think of one, but I can't off the top of my head. So, so what makes a sentence a conclusion is that you are arguing for it, what makes it a premise is that you are using it to argue for something else. Okay, is this an argument? Hands up if you think it is. Could be. Oh. It depends. Yeah. <laughs> it depends. Hmm. It's a more difficult one, isn't it? But if it were a conclusion, which would... If it were an argument, which would be the conclusion? Things are things are okay, so then the premise would be Jesse James left town... And Jesse James took his gang with him. Yeah. So we could say Jesse James left town, Jesse James took his gang with him, therefore things have been yeah. a lot quieter. Yeah. Yeah. There's an implied premise in the way I've read it that, that uh, Jesse James and his gang. Is a we can make of anything not an argument. Being quiet. Yes. I don't think that's an argument myself. Uh, I, I think it's just a, a concatenation of, of <laughs> sentences, i.e., yeah. several sentences strung together. Um, and it, it, there might probably, in fact, there probably is a causal relationship too, isn't there? Why are things quieter? Because Jesse James left town and taken, he's taken his gang with him as well. Isn't that just an explanation? Ah, now, explanations, reasons and causes. Now you're really getting into the interesting stuff. Explanations can be both causal and rational, can't they? So I can give an explanation of your behaviour that's rational, or I can give an explanation of your behaviour that's causal. So, what's your name? Paul. Paul. Okay, so the reason Paul did that was yeah. whatever. Or Paul did that because, what's your name? Jenny. Jenny pushed him. Yeah. You know, Jenny pushed him, Paul fell over. Okay, or Paul fell over because he was trying to make the children laugh. Do you see? One's a yeah. rational explanation and the other's a causal explanation. Causes, reasons, and explanations are, are intimately tied together, and we'll talk about them probably quite often in these sessions. But the important thing is that um, 
it might be that, that not all causes are reasons. It may be that all reasons are causes, but it's not the case that all causes are reasons. Um, because some causes are non-rational. They have no reasons involved in them at all. Anyway, this is getting complicated, and you don't need to worry about this. The important thing is that a set of sentences is only an argument if you're putting one forward as true and putting the others forward as reasons for believing the one. That's what an argument is. So if a set of sentences doesn't have that relation between them, it isn't an argument. There may be some other reason why the time is closed. They might have increased the police force. So it may be just a coincidence. Yes, you may not be saying there's even a causal relationship here. You know, actually, since Jesse Dane's left town taking his gang with him, things have been a lot quieter because it's not been necessary to, to do this, that, or the other. Yes. Yeah. But you could very easily supply a context in which that was an argument. Uh, well, as I said, you can supply a context in which anything is an argument, so that's true. Yeah. Um, is a set of sentences an argument subjective or objective? Oh. I mean, is it a matter of opinion? <coughs> well, is it? Um, I mean, if we go back to... I mean, you can answer this question yourself. If we go back to that one, is it a matter of opinion that that's an argument? Or, or did I somehow make it an argument? I mean, did I make it appear to be an argument? Or did I make it an argument? I mean, I might have made it appear to be an argument by making it an yeah. argument. Yeah. Yeah. And therefore it became an argument, or, or rather you started to see that it was an argument. Is, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, objective and subjective. When I used to teach undergraduates, I used to say that I wouldn't let them use those words until their third year. Um, because they're very difficult words. And the reason they're very different, difficult words is because there are objective facts about subjective things. Um, if you think of a subjective state as the state of a subject, a state of happiness or something like that, then there are objective facts about such states. I mean, either you're happy now or you're not. That's a bad example, actually, happiness. Anyway, you can see what I mean. I can someone reject an argument because they say, oh. I don't think it's an argument. Or do you mean it's not a valid argument? Oh, well, that's, uh, I was just going to make that distinction. Okay, two questions you might ask. That isn't an argument, or that isn't a good argument. That isn't an argument. Um, clearly, you can make that distinction, uh, that claim. Um, whether the person making it... That's an interesting one. If you mind, I, I'd leave that on one side, because I'll think about what I think about that. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I have a feeling you'd say yes it is but then you'd have to provide the context which would make it clear to the other person that it's an argument ok let's move on so you, so you, you, you talked to John Cleese and that's what John Cleese was saying what did he say? oh that's not an argument indeed he did say that that's right that's not an argument um, and what he meant by that is that's just a contradiction yeah. you have just two sentences one of which contradicts the other that's not an argument and that's an argument against but it's not an argument against the truth of it is it it's the argument against the truth of that's an argument <laughs> oh clarity of thought it's wonderful right let's move on um, OK, there are often words that suggest that a set of sentences is an argument. Um, we, when we looked at these, um, we saw that um, you, sir, wanted a because in there, because that would have convinced you it was an argument. Should it have done? No, no. no not necessarily. Because does sometimes indicate an argument, but not always. Um, OK, where's the argument word in... Um, this one. Sense. Hang on. Oh, okay. What about that one? So. So, so. so yeah. Okay. Can you give me any more? Yes. Uh, ah, if then is a difficult one. Um, the answer is, well, actually, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Can I? We'll put if on one side uh, because you've got to distinguish between implication and entailment, but we'll do that in a minute. 
Hence. Hence is a good one. Yeah. Given. Given. There. Then. Yeah. Then is another one that's a bit iffy, actually. Therefore. Therefore is is very definitely an argument word. Yeah. Um, notice incidentally that there are words that. Um, consequently. Consequently. Yeah. Okay. Let's leave that. So so firstly we've we've said what an argument is. And we've said how to distinguish an argument from a set of sentences. Um, but we've also got to distinguish um, an argument from an assertion, just a straightforward assertion. Okay, an argument is a set of sentences, just one of which is being asserted. Okay, an assertion is a single sentence, possibly a complex sentence, so it might be Marianne's wearing jeans and it's Friday. So that's one sentence conjoined with a, a sentence conjunction, the and, um, that's being expressed in assertoric mode. So which of these sentences are or could be assertions? Number one. Yeah. Only yeah. number one, exactly so. Um, I say could be because, of course, it could be said, I could say the room is hot in that Australian intonation that makes it a question. Um, do you see what I mean? So, so I could ask a question in, in a form of words that would usually be used for assertoric. So again, remember that language is something we use and we can use it in all sorts of different ways. But this, is, uh, this sentence has interrogative force, doesn't it? Is the room hot? And this has imperative force, turn the heat up. Um, that one is being used assertorically, um, not the others. Um, some assertions, and this will pick up the point you were making there, look very like arguments. If it's snowing, the mail will be late. Okay? So you might think that this is an argument because it's an if-then sentence. Why isn't that an argument? <coughs> Can anyone tell me? It's an assertion. It, uh, <laughs> well done. Yes, it is an assertion. It's hypothetical, that's right. isn't it? Yeah. So it might be snowing, it might not be. It's, it's, not, it's not based on any truth. It's not definite. Okay. Um, you s- Good. Okay. Are we asserting it is snowing? No. 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 Are we asserting the mail will be late? No. 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 Are we asserting if it's snow, the mail will be late? Yes. 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 So there's only one sentence there, isn't there? It happens to be complex. Uh, it's a it's a sentence that uh, the subsentential parts are themselves sentential. Um, but it's not an argument because it doesn't satisfy the description, does it? It doesn't satisfy the, the claim that there must be a sentence that's being put forward as true and other sentences that are being put forward to support the claim that that one sentence is true. So that's an entail, uh, sorry, that's an, uh, an implication, not uh, an entailment. Okay? So um, that. It's no, it implies the mail will be late. It doesn't entail that the mail will be late. Question at the back. Uh, well, it make it ungrammatical, actually. Therefore, it is snowing, the mail will no, be no, late. No, no. Sorry, not replace one with the other, but it is snowing, therefore, the mail will be late. That would make it an argument, because the therefore signals an entailment. Um, then can signal entailment, but, but doesn't automatically. Um, but therefore, I was going to say something very rash there, but therefore always does, and I may be right about that. But, uh, okay, um, so we need to distinguish things like that from arguments. Um, now we get on to the bit that's um, been worrying around this end of the room here. Okay, the thing about assertions is they're either true or false. Okay? Now, this is an interesting thing. There are only two sorts of things that can be true or false in this world. One of them is beliefs. Beliefs are either true or false. And the other is the sentences that we use to express beliefs. Okay? So, if I believe that the chair is blue... I can express that belief in the sentence, the chair is blue, and both the belief and the sentence used to express it can be either true or false. Are you with me? Can you think of anything else that can be true or false? 
No, facts are what make sentences true or false. They are not themselves true or false, they just exist or don't exist. So, the fact that that chair is blue makes true the sentence that chair is blue. You with me? Okay. What about her hair is blonde? Uh, like, when you say that, are you saying what about that fact or that sentence? That sentence. That sentence. Um, well, that's either true or false, isn't it? I mean, if you. Um, I mean, let me just point out an ambiguity. In what, what's your name? Fiona. Fiona said, uh, "What about what did you say? Her hair is blonde. Her hair." is blonde. Um, if I put it like that, I'm talking about the fact, aren't I? Whereas if I took it, do that, I'm now talking about the sentence. Right? If I take those out again, that's not the sort of thing can be, that can be true, because the fact that someone's hair is blonde, that her hair is blonde, makes true the sentence, her hair is blonde. You with me? Difficult stuff, philosophy, isn't it? <laughs> but, but the really nice thing is that if you persevere with logic, you too will like, be able to do things like this. You know, these distinctions are there to be made. You just need the clarity of thought to be able to make them. Is that because facts are just always true? So ah, facts aren't true at all. Fact, facts are what makes sentences true. Facts, either ex facts, if you like, are combinations of um, things or events, or things or properties and events. So, if you think of something like her hair is blonde, that's a fact. Okay, her hair's being blonde. Um, her jacket's being green. Is it green? Yeah, well, I think so. Right. <laughs> Whether that's a fact or not, we're not really sure. <laughs> if it's green, then there's a fact of the, of the matter, which is that, sorry, I didn't mean to call you her. <laughs> Diana's jacket is green. Um, these are facts which either exist or not. I mean, a bit, um, some people might say that that's not a fact, that Diana's jacket is green. Um, the sentence that expresses that, the belief that that's a fact, is false. Sorry, I lost myself in the beginning of that sentence. Is it like like the sentence earlier, like, you know, about the witch being made of wood? The, the witch is made of wood was a fact in that sentence. Uh, that sentence referred to a fact, if you like. Um, Even though witches aren't made of wood in that context. So you could argue that the question was false. Oh, I see. It referred to a, a potential fact, a putative fact. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yes, of course. Uh, no, that's a thank you. That's a very good point to make. Of course, if I say something false, um, what makes it false is a fact, but but it's not the fact. So if I say that chair's black, um, the fact of the chair's not being black is what makes that true. <laughs> It gets difficult, <laughs> as you can see. But, but the thing to remember is this. There are three different levels that, that we very importantly have to keep separate in thinking clearly. And of course, all critical reasoning involves clarity of thought. But these levels are the level of language, thought, Uh, and the thing I always call reality, but that's, it, that's wrong, because of course language and thoughts are real, so, so that's completely wrong, but I keep using it that way. Um, so if I put down red, okay, and I put quotes round so that you make it, clear, make it clear that it is a word, okay, it's a linguistic item, then there's the concept red, okay, it's, it's when I think that is red, Okay, I'm using the concept red. And then there's redness, the property. <coughs> so these three things are quite different from each other, aren't they? So if I say um, this pen has the property of being red, okay, I'm talking about this. And if I'm thinking about this pen as being red, then I'm exercising my concept of red. And if I say 
this pen is red, then I'm using the word red. Notice in French, it would be a different word, wouldn't it? But the same concept and the same property. So there's an arbitrary element in language that isn't there in the other two. So what's the French then? <laughs> Rouge, I think. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad I used red, not something else. <laughs> I'm sorry, could you speak um, up? Uh, isn't there an argument of red? I mean, different people will see red differently. Some people might see that colour is red, some people might see it. This is metaphysics 101. <laughs> so, so you can't really, can you really say that a fact is true? Because red oh, facts are true. But, but they're not true, they're not the same truth for different people. Because right, okay, okay. let's unpack red. what you're because talking about red. here in terms of facts and truths and so on. Um, okay, what you're suggesting is that um, what I see as red, Mike might see as Orange. green or something else. Okay, so what we're saying is, why isn't anyone wearing red? Will somebody please come next time wearing red? Maybe I will. Um, it makes it much easier. There's a lady at the back wearing pink, uh, or in the middle there. So when I look at that lady, what's your name? Hildegard, right. <laughs> okay, when I look at Hildegard's jacket, I see pink. I see it looks like that. And when Mike looks at it, it looks different. Okay, so it appears differently to Mike. So um, it, I would say that jacket is pink. Um, and of course, Mike would also say it's pink. Okay, but pink is different for, for Mike than it is for me. That's what you're, where are you? That's what you're saying. Okay. I'm saying you might not call it pink, you might actually call it red, because a lot of men, I mean, people see colours <laughs> A lot of men are useless at colours, is that what you're going to say? <laughs> well, no, a lot of people, I mean, some people might say that's magenta and not pink, or some people would say that... Yeah, like, shall we not get into that? But, that's, but isn't, that what, isn't that the basis, because how can you say that something is a fact? Well, let's, let's make a very important distinction between epistemology and metaphysics here. Uh, there's one question, which is, is something a fact? And there's another question, do we know it's a fact? Okay, so let's talk about it is pink as a fact, okay, um, rather than do we know it's a fact? Um, Wittgenstein showed us that actually the question, could we see it differently, is actually a non-question. The answer is, um, if, oh, no, this is getting too complicated, it's going to take us too far away from, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to tease no, you with this, but I've just realised what I was about to get into. I'm just trying to clarify what you mean by saying, you know, because by definition, for me personally, if you say something's a belief, it's either true or false. How, I mean, by definition, for me, a belief is something you can't prove or disprove. You just believe it. So how can you logically argue that God is the source? Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh, right, okay. You're using beliefs in a, in a, word, in a way that um, lots of people do, so actually I'm very glad you brought this up. People think of beliefs as things that you can't prove. So you have either belief or you have knowledge. Well, that's not how we use the word belief in philosophy. A belief is something... Um, you postulate an explanation of someone's behaviour or is something you put forward um, as true or as false. Um, and it's certainly not the case that it's something you can't prove. I mean, there are many beliefs that we can prove. I mean, just uh, uh, his, I believe that two plus two is four and I dare say that you wouldn't want me to even attempt to prove that because you believe it too. Is that reasonable? Yeah. Okay. So here's a belief that we can that we believe is conclusive. True. So so we don't mean belief to mean religious belief or, or something like that. Um, look, this is perhaps it. If we go back to this um, let's use chair concept of chair and chair here. Um, so a chair is something I can draw. Okay, I can't draw the concept of a chair, can I? I can only entertain it. Um, and I can say chair has five letters. See what I mean? Okay, chairs exist. Now that's a fact which I can think about 
do chairs exist? Barclay said that chairs didn't exist except as perceptions in my mind. Um, and of course I can then talk about what I'm thinking about. So the fact that chairs exist, um, if indeed it is a fact, is something we can think about and talk about. Do you, do you see the distinction? You, you may not feel confident in using it at the moment, but that's just a matter of practice. It's, if we confuse these three levels, we will not think clearly, because you might end up thinking like the concept chair has five letters. Well, concepts don't have any letters, actually. Or you might think chairs have five letters. Well, actually, chairs don't have any letters. It doesn't make sense to think of a chair as having letters. See what I mean? Yeah. Keep these... So going back to this one, um, if I said... This jug is loud. What would you think? This jug is loud. I would wonder if you're meaning it in a different context than saying. Well, and it'd be perfectly reasonable for you to mean it to think that because actually that doesn't make any sense, that sentence, does it? Because jugs aren't the sort of thing that can be loud. Okay, but it's just not, it would have to be metaphorical, I'd have to be being poetic or something like that. Or I would just not, I would be displaying my misunderstanding of the word loud or the misunderstanding of the word jug. Is that right? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. When you say that argument is false, you display the fact that you don't understand either the word ar argument or false. This arguments can't be true or false. Okay. Um, arguments can only be good or bad. They can be valid or invalid. They can't be true or false. And that's because it's the only things that are true or false are beliefs or sentences, the sentences that express beliefs. Now, in general, everyday talk, we do talk about arguments being true or false. Um, you know, everybody does that, but... but if you want to learn how to reason, if you want to learn how to think clearly about argument, you must stop doing that, because arguments can't be false. What is it for a belief to be false? If I, if I, talk, about, if I talk about Mike is tall, okay, what is it for that belief to be false? Small. It, it's for the thing that I mean by Mike to not be in the, in the class of things that are tall. Is that right? And arguments are sets of sentences. You can't uh, evaluate them in that way, can you? Isn't there a term, though, that, um, uh, that there's a form of argument that is termed the truth preserving? Um, all arguments are truth preserving, um, or at least all good arguments are truth preserving, because the truth of the premises is preserved in the truth of the conclusion. So it's still, it's, uh, to say that an argument is true, and we'll talk about that later on. So they're not saying it's true. But we're not saying the argument is true, we're saying it's truth-preserving, oh, okay. which is a different thing entirely. Yeah. Um, okay, do, do we understand this? This is crucially important, because um, to understand what truth is, um, is to see that it, it's predicated only of sentences and beliefs, not of arguments. And to understand what an argument is, is to see that it can't be true or false. I think you can see that with the argument about the wood and the witches. You can see what? That it can't be... It's, that it was a valid argument. Uh, right. What? Doesn't that differentiate from, from truth? The truth is only contained in that argument. Um, Nobody would say that a witch is made of wood unless you bought it at a store. But in terms of the way the argument was constructed, the reasoning was valid. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure how to unpack what you're saying here, except to say that um, that's actually... Uh, oh, yes, that, well, that was an argument. Um, it's an argument because we're saying that that is true, and we're offering as reasons for believing it's truth, the truth of that and the truth of that. Okay? So 
the argument itself is a good one, and you use the word valid, and we'll get on to valid at some point next week, I think, but um, that's, that's um, the argument itself can't be true or false, but the sentences that constitute the argument can, of course, be either true or false. So if um, the sentences are false, does it make the argument bad? Ah, yeah. Well, that, that's a very important one. We'll come to that later. So does that sentence actually contain three assertions? Um, it contains three sentences, each of which could be used as an assertion. And in order for a sentence to be an assertion, it's got to be asserted. Um, and I'm not really asserting this, I'm just talking about it. But yeah, so we have three potential assertions, each of which is either true or false. Uh, and together, they make up the argument because two are being offered as reasons for believing the truth of the other. Right, okay, a good argument, this is coming on to your point now, a, two, the, a good argument must have at least two um, characteristics. Actually, it needs many more than two characteristics, but there are two that we're really interested in. These are the two. The conclusion must follow from the premises, okay, and the premises must all be true. Okay, if both those things are true, you've got a good argument, um, if one of these things, if, if the conclusion doesn't follow, then even if the premises are true, you haven't got a convincing argument. Or if the premises are not true, uh, and the even though the conclusion follows, then um, you haven't got a, a good argument in that way because the premises are false. But having said that... Um, we're interested only in argument in this session. We're not actually interested in the truth of, of the premises at all. We're interested only in, in the, whether the arguments follow from, sorry, whether the conclusion follows from the premises. So as logicians generally, um, we're not in the business of going out in the world to see whether premises are true or false. We're only in the business of seeing whether the relation between the, the premises and the conclusion is such that the, uh, the conclusion follows from the premises. And as we'll see next week, there are loads of different ways in which conclusions can follow from premises. Um, but, so I, of, I would often talk about an argument being good, uh, even though the premises... I mean, let's take this one. OK, is that a good argument or not? Yeah. 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 It's good in the logician sense, isn't it? I mean, actually, the premises are, are all false, aren't they? They're both false. There are only two premises of this argument. They're both false. It's not Friday. It's Monday. And uh, Marianne always wears jeans on Friday. It's also false. You'll have to take it from me. So that's not a good argument from the point of view of the premises. But as far as a logician is concerned, that is a good argument because the conclusion follows from the premises. Okay. So if we were actually using that argument to say anything, we'd want the premises to be true as well. But as we're just talking about the argument in order to, to say what's a good argument and what isn't a good argument, that will do. In fact, it's, if that's a conclusive argument, isn't it? If the premises are true there, the conclusion would have to be true. Um, so it's a very good argument. So let's... Uh, no, yes. because if the premises are true here, the conclusion would have to be true, wouldn't it? Which, not which is something? What, what? Not unless you died before Friday. Uh, well, then it wouldn't be true that um, Marianne always wears jeans on a Friday. You'd say Marianne always wore jeans on a Friday, maybe. Yes, yes. Okay. yes. yes. What did you mean? Jeans. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure dead people wear jeans at all, actually. Could you just remind me, what makes a premise true? Is that the facts in the world? Uh, a premise is true if, if there's... Actually, you're asking a huge philosophical question there, but let me just say, um, yes, if there's a fact that makes a sentence true, then it's true. Yeah. Oh, I can't believe I said that. <laughs> Philosophically, that's awful, but never mind, that'll do. What were you going to say? You can't always say that you always wear jeans on Friday because you haven't had all your Fridays, have you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope so. I hope I haven't had all my Fridays. You're quite right. Well, you can't actually say that. You can't say that you always wear jeans on Friday because you haven't had 
this is actually a type of argument we're going to be looking at next week, which is the inductive arguments. And inductive arguments always take us further than we can actually go by claiming something like swans are always white, Marianne always wears jeans on a Friday. But, but you could still say that... Um, We are not going to get into knowledge. The philosophy of knowledge is, is definitely not on this curriculum. <laughs> um, okay, going back to what I was saying there. Um, okay, so do you understand the difference between the truth of the premise and the conclusions following from the, the premises? That, that's the important thing. And it's because what makes an argument good is that the conclusion follows from the premises that you've got to distinguish the goodness of an argument from the truth of, of the premises. Truth, just because truth is a good thing and validity, say, is a good thing, doesn't make them the same thing. Um, that's the important thing. We mustn't just take validity as a, a sort of general pro-word. And in the same way, truth isn't just a general pro-word. Okay, let's have a look at these arguments. Okay, one of them's good, one of them's bad. Don't call out, but just have a look at them yourselves and decide which is the good one and which is the bad one. Who's decided? All right, a bit more time. Okay, who's decided? Okay. Is that a good argument? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Is that a good argument? No. no. Well done. Yeah, absolutely. You see, you don't need to come to this class at all. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. Um, this is um, a deductive argument. It gives us absolute certainty in the following sense. If these premises, and I'll read out the premises, uh, if it's Monday, the lecture will finish at 3.30, it is Monday, therefore the lecture will finish at 3.30. If these premises are both true, this conclusion would have to be true, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, it couldn't be false if those two premises are, are both true. Um, so the truth of the premises is preserved in the truth of the conclusion there. Um, you, you, you couldn't have those two premises true and that conclusion not. So if you believe those two premises... Rationally speaking, you must believe that conclusion. Okay, that's what it is to be a rational animal. And instantly, I, I say you're wasting your time coming to these lectures if you knew that. Of course, that's nonsense because you're all rational animals. You have to be rational animals. It, you wouldn't be here if you weren't because you saw the, the leaflet or whatever you saw and you thought that sounds interesting. I would like to go to that lecture. That lecture starts at 2 o'clock on Monday, the whatever date this is at the moment. Uh, therefore, I will go to that lecture hall. Did you not? You had loads of reasons. For... So um, we're talking theoretical arguments here, but of course, actually, arguments are the most practi practical thing in the world. Your bit of practical reasoning led you here. Um, so each one of you is rational. What we're doing in these lectures is learning how to um, explicate our capacity for reason. Okay? You know whether a, a conclusion follows from premises or not. You, that's why when you argue in the pub with your sons, daughters, wives, or whoever, um, you know whether what you're hearing is a good argument or not. Uh, you can, there's something wrong with that argument, you say, as you read the leader in the newspaper, or as you hear the person on television, or something like that. Something wrong with that argument. Your intuitions, are, your rational intuitions are telling you um, what you need to know. But... What you're doing in these classes is learning how to make explicit your intuitions, what, what your intuitions are telling you. Okay, so your intuitions tell you quite categorically that that's a good argument, that's a bad one. What's wrong with this one? Much is good finish at uh, the same time and early day. It's not explicit. Yes, okay. Everything I heard there is, is, is good. The fact is that, okay, let me ask you a question. Could it be the case that these two premises are true 
and yet this conclusion false. Yes. Yes. Okay. Can anyone give me a counterexample to this argument? Let me read them out again for the people who can't hear. <laughs> um, if it's Monday, the lecture will finish at 3.30. The lecture will finish at 3.30. Therefore, it's Monday. Okay. Can anyone give me a counterexample to that argument? A situation in which both those premises are true and that conclusion is false. A situation in which both those premises are true and that conclusion is false. Good, well done. Or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, exactly. Um, this says if it's Monday the lecture will finish at 3.30, this merely says the lecture will finish at 3.30. It could be Monday, but it might not be. Okay? So there is a situation in which both these premises are true and this conclusion is false, therefore this is a bad argument. It's an invalid argument. It's actually a, a, an instance of the fallacy of affirming the consequent. Because do you see that the, the lecture... The, lectures and the arguments, whatever they are, they look very similar, but of course they're not, because this one's taken the antecedent as the second premise, and this one's taken the consequent as the second premise. And we'll be learning a lot more about fallacies later on in the course. But, that's it for today. Next week we're going to look at the, uh, all the different sorts of argument they, they, arguments there are, and how to distinguish them from each other. Um, and then we're going to get on to learning how to set them out properly and how to evaluate them. Okay, we've got a quarter of an hour for, for questions. Can you tell me how to get a car parked for permit? No. <laughs> That's easy. You could try bringing Hazel. She might be able to tell you, but I doubt it. Who is this Barclay that thought that there was only a concept, and what did he sit on? <laughs> he didn't think a chair was only a concept. Um, it was Bishop Barclay, oh. um, George Barclay, who lived, I don't know when he lived, I I'm sorry, I can never remember dates. Um, he believed that uh, our only reason for believing that something exists is because we can either see it now, um, or that we could see it under some other circumstances. So, um, if I claim, okay, what makes it true that this lectern exists? So we can see it, we can hear it, we can touch it, um, all sorts of things. Uh, what's more, we also believe that were we to come back tonight at midnight uh, and nobody had moved it and so on, all, all the other things being equal, it would still be here. Okay, so there we have a, an appeal to actual perceptions. Okay, we can see it now. And we've got an appeal to counterfactual perceptions. If we came at 12 o'clock, we would be able to see it. And Barclay says, you give me a reason for thinking that anything exists that doesn't depend upon actual or counterfactual perceptions. Sorry, well... Let me rephrase that. You will not be able to give me a reason for thinking that anything exists that doesn't appeal to one or other of those two. Therefore, if, you, if something is unperceivable, <coughs> then you have no reason for thinking it exists. What about concepts? Uh, well, we experience concepts all the time, don't we? Mm -hmm. Do they exist? Uh, you wouldn't be thinking a, per, a concept is a, a constituent of a thought. So as long as you think you think, then you will think in concepts, and you have reason to think in concepts exist. Yeah. Sorry. Well, is that the same sort of thing as you know the, the fir tree collapsing in the middle of some forest somewhere, but nobody hearing it, and making yes. a noise? Yes. I mean, the, the fact is, if you were in the forest, you would hear it. Yeah. You might want because to say because your experience okay. is. Other forests that you have been in, that it would make a noise. Or, or no, that's, yeah. I mean, w uh, your reason for thinking that the noise exists is that you would hear it if you were there. Mm. Um, so that's a counterfactual yeah. um, perception that you're basing that on. I mean, what Barclay is very important, and he's a fascinating philosopher actually. He, he thinks that um, 
physical objects are made up of ideas of ours. He's, he's one of the first idealists. And he doesn't mean that you, know, you can put your hand through this because it's an idea. He just means that my idea of this lectern is an idea made up of partly of solidity, the idea that if I do that, I won't be able to push any further. That's a perception notice. Um, that's a perception. It's a bundle of perceptions. Well, that um, we, we only um, have second order accounts of uh, everything because you know, what we're, this idea that uh, our, what we see is actually the result of a, a, rea a reaction in the brain to something that's come through the retina and gets translated into a particular way. So there's a kind of projection. Are you thinking of sense data, perhaps? So, so that we never see the object directly, we just see. Yes, it's a kind of dark room, you know, where, where something's yeah. being played on um, the screen. But, uh, I thought that was there are two of ways of thinking about sense data. One way is now very old-fashioned, and um, we don't think of it that way anymore, and that's the way that Russell and Wittgenstein and people like that thought of it, which is that um, we never see the thing itself. Yeah. We only ever see an idea in our mind. So, and why would you think that's answer? Because you can never be sure that... I mean. Could it, are you really sure that I'm here? I mean, your reasons for, being, for believing that I'm here is you can see me, hear me, and so on, but couldn't it be with you exactly as it is now, and yet it not be true that I'm here? Can the anyone, when you say no, have you never had a lucid dream? Was it you said no? I, I said no. Oh, you said no. I'm sorry. <laughs> you said no. I do. So you don't think that you could have an experience as if I were here doing what I'm doing and yet I'm not here. You'll probably have one of those tonight. <laughs> Dreaming would be one. But, but here's another one. I mean, what makes you, what you think at the moment is that you're having perceptions as of me and that what's causing those perceptions is me and what's more, your perceptions are, are a good guide to what I'm like. But look, if we talk about the causal relation, if we think that A must cause B, or sorry, A causes B, we have to know about both A and B, don't we? We have to see that they're constantly conjoined, they're correlated, something like that. Um, we can't, so we've got to be standing here, if you like, to see that A and B are correlated. Um, but if you're thinking of B as um, a chair, and A as your idea of a chair, um, and you can't get outside your ideas, and here is where you stand with respect to your perceptions, isn't it? How can you get outside your perceptions to see what causes them? You see what I mean? Because you can't, it's got an objective existence because you can't, I can't change. In a dream, you can, if it's a lucid dream, you can change. Yeah, but we're not talking about dreams now, we're talking no, about. Saying, but, but with something that's objectively, uh, factually out there, existing, uh, the observer can't change the you know, uh, movement or, or whatever of that. Yeah, hang on, let me ask the question again. If we're talking about your idea of a chair, your ideas of a chair, concepts of a chair and so on, and chairs, can you get outside your idea of a chair in order to see that it's caused by a chair? Now, if, if it can be with me exactly as it is now, here I am, I'm looking at this chair, I'm touching the chair, I'm hearing the chair, all sorts of things, and yes, it's possible that I might be asleep, okay, and there being no chair here. Um, even if I'm asleep, I might want to say something like, well, I must have experienced the chair before in order to be able to do this, um, I could say, well, why should I think in the first place that there is something that's causing my perceptions? All I've got is my perceptions. I can't get outside my perceptions to adopt this perspective on them, can I? So are you saying you can create the idea of the chair in your mind without actually having seen them? Maybe not me creating them, it may be... Um, an evil demon. What I'm giving you here is the Cartesian thought experiment. Um, the, the idea being that um, 
If you push what you know to the final degree, you'll see that actually you're, the only reason you believe in the physical universe and things outside yourself, and that includes your own body, um, is because you assume that your perceptions are caused by something outside yourself, outside your mind, and that your mind is a good guide to the nature of these things. And if you question both those perceptions, you're left with nothing. Because what makes you think that um, there's something outside causing your perceptions if all you can see is the perceptions themselves rather than the causal relation between your perceptions and whatever's causing them? We're getting a bit away from critical reasoning here. Yeah, we are. What you can see is your, the, the reaction and your attempts to control what's around you. If, if you try and do something that the object doesn't do what you want it to do, then you could conclude that it's outside of you. But all you're talking about is one experience after another, aren't you? Um, I mean, there are some perceptions of mine that um, obey my will, and there are other perceptions of mine that don't. That chair doesn't obey my will. That, that particular perception doesn't obey my will, whereas others do. I, I think perhaps I've, I've introduced the Cartesian thought experiment with too little time um, to convince you. Um, I mean, you can go away and read the first meditation. It's very easy to read. It's um, Actually, it doesn't take much longer so to read than... Who, who argues against it? Um, to show... uh, Barclay. Barclay's idea... I, I mean, the Cartesian thought experiments completely revolutionised philosophy because it revolutionised our belief that we could claim to have knowledge. Barclay attempted to get over that because if we... Um... Okay, here's the world and here's our mind and here's the evil demon. Um, if Descartes has shown that once this is in place and you see that could be exactly as it is whatever this is like um, you need to say that something about our knowledge of the external world and what Barclay is doing is he's remaking the world in the mind so if there is nothing more to a physical object than a set of perceptions and if the only thing of which we can have knowledge is our perceptions then there's no reason why we can't have knowledge of, of physical objects if they are perceptions. So Barclay was trying to show that we do have knowledge despite the Cartesian thought experiment. Anyway, there is no way we're going to... If you would like to know more about that, you'll have to come to another set of lectures. Okay. Um, I see a, there is time for one more question, if anyone would like one. Just a, just a break. Uh, there's one at the back there. So Lady, you have to pass on it. Uh, no. <laughs> um, what do you mean on what they're... Um... Well, they're all good on them, or they wouldn't be on the reading list. The uh, short introduction to logic is, is very interesting, and that's very easy to read and very short, so um, I'll have a go at that. The Hackett book... Um, on the little um, the leaflet that went... No, okay, well, if you look outside, they'll find, you'll find the leaflets on the thing, and you should find the reading list. Yeah, I just have a book. Sorry, say that again? Yes, I know it sounds printed. It's very irritating, isn't it? You can get it on um, Amazon. You can get that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, the reason it's irritating is it's a very good little book. Um, if you can't find it on Amazon, let me know. You can't, that's right. Um, yes. I can't remember who it's by, sorry. It's, it's on the reading list. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll stop there. Thank you for coming, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>